I'm Philip Thornton, and I'd like to welcome you to the teaching ministry of Legacy Faith Church. With ears to hear and eyes to see, it's now time for you to feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. Now let's get into the word together. But we are here to receive from heaven, not from a man. But as God uses a man to speak his word, it is the word that the man speaks that will establish or cause faith to come alive. Until words are spoken, there are no images. If you don't understand the principles of God's kingdom, there was nothing that existed until God spoke. Even though it existed in his will, his will is his word. His will preceded his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. His word and his will are the same, but it is not and was not until his word was spoken that anything existed. Why is this important? Because today we're talking about how the word of God will produce and perform in you whatever it is that you have need of. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Whatever it is that you have need of. So in First Peter, I know I told you to go to Psalms 119. I'm going to, I'll go back to that. But uh, Second Peter, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 19 was the opening verse that we spoke last night. And I want you to get this one established in your heart. Verse 18 says, the voice which came from heaven we heard. Everybody say heard. heard. The voice that, we, that came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you will do well that you take heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. You have a more sure word of prophecy. It will do you well to take heed because there is light that is shining in a dark place. And as we said last night, when the day star dawns in your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's one thing that I have understood about the kingdom of God is that God is a God of revelation. God is a God who delights in revealing himself unto his people. God has not hidden himself from you. The Bible clearly tells us the secret things belong unto the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children. As a believer, what you need to understand today is that which is revealed unto you belongs to you and nothing can take it from you. So today as the word of God is going forth and as God's word continues to come, when that day star comes in your heart, nobody can take it from you and you have the right to possess it the moment the light shines. The reason that many people don't walk in the supernatural power of God is because they don't give themselves to the process of the day star. They don't give themselves to the process of allowing the spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge in Christ to come alive on the inside of them. Because I'm here to tell you, people, when you see it, you can have it. This morning, as we continue in this uh, miracle and healing seminar, what I'm after is to help you see what God has already done. And when you see it, bless God, you will receive it. It's really not that difficult. Matter of fact, it's almost too simple. The Bible tells us that, that it's so simple that sometimes it causes the wise to become confounded. That the foolish things of this world confound the wise because it does not make natural sense how God could come into the earth as a man 2,000 years ago and at one act take the sins of all of mankind and there forgive the rest of the world of their sins. At the same time, how one man could take upon himself stripes and every sickness and disease and infirmity throughout all of the history of mankind and in one act become the substitution for it so that you can walk free from it. It doesn't make sense. 
But it doesn't make any more. But that makes just as much sense as him forgiving you of your sins as it does healing you of your sickness and your disease. In other words, people, he did that. And if you can believe he'll forgive you of your sins, then you can certainly believe that he'll heal you. It is God's will to heal. We spent a couple of hours last night just hitting the fact that it is God's will to heal. It's not God's will for any man to suffer where Jesus already suffered for them. Why would you want to take upon yourself something that God has already done for you? This is part of the day star that needs to come alive in your heart because as believers, many of us through false teaching, doctrines and traditions of men have been taught that somehow God has to teach us lessons or somehow through the things that we carry that those become our instructors. Those are not your instructors. The Bible tells you very clearly who and what your instructor is and it is the word. The Word is your instructor. The Bible tells us again, as we talked about just a minute ago, that God has exalted His Word even above His name. So as we hear the Word of God this morning, I want you to be ready because like I said last night, People, there are people that are going to receive creative miracles just sitting in the room, not because I laid my hands on them, even though every person I lay my hands on will recover. Right? But as you're sitting in the room and hearing God's word, it's God's word that performs the work. The testimonies last night, we've already had several, but we've had people that, that have already called back in this morning saying, you, you, you just don't understand. It's just, I, 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 I wasn't like this, right? Well, pastor, I didn't feel anything. People, it's not about your feeling. It's about faith. And all of a sudden, that day star, that the light comes on on the inside of you, and you begin to realize, wait a minute. Why am I carrying something that God the Messiah already carried for me? Why don't I just shift? Praise the Lord. So today, we're going to continue to step in this. And I believe, people, when I get, I'm telling you, I got something in my spirit I can't wait to get to. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You're going to see, amen, you're going to see, and if you can see it, you can have it. Praise the Lord. So, as we get ready to get into the Word, go to Psalms 119, and I want to share this quickly. Psalms chapter 119, I mentioned this last night. For those of you that are here, maybe you're new, maybe this is um, somewhat of a new style of teaching as it relates to the kingdom of God. Well, I'm not going to apologize for it. I believe that this is how the apostle Paul taught. I believe this is how Peter and James taught. They came hard at you with the word and let God confirm his word. I don't believe that they came to make men religious. They didn't come into each town and city to gather a few people together to start some sort of religious sect. They came into a region to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And as God's kingdom was preached and part of the gospel of the kingdom that we're going to see here in just a minute is Jesus, him crucified and rose or who rose again. People rising again from the dead has everything to do with your healing. Anything that's dead in you, he will raise it up today. Anything that's out of order, he'll raise it up today. Anything that has come in you to kill, to steal, or to destroy, he will heal you and deliver you from it. That is who Jesus is. He's the one who came to set captives free, and he said it himself. Oh, the devil comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Everything that has death on it came from the devil. If you've got a sickness, a disease, or an infirmity in your body, people, God didn't give it to you. It came right out of hell. If you've got deterioration in your bones, or you've got hardness in your arteries, or cancer in your blood, none of that came from God, and God the Holy Ghost today is here to remove it. Glory to God. Psalms 119. We talked about 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Psalms 119. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Verse 
just for the sake of time, because I do have some place I want to go, and I'm not going to take the time I took last night, because I got many things to do. Glory to God. Verse 27. Well, praise the Lord. Therefore, I love your commandments, God, above gold. I read these last night. Yes, above fine gold. I love your word, God. I love your commandments above everything else. There's nothing on this world that can compare. Now, just so you know, people, God's word has the ability to produce and create in you anything that you have need of. So when you come into the commandments of God, praise God, there is nothing, no good thing that God will withhold. I'm not going to get into that. Verse 128, therefore, I will esteem all of your precepts concerning all things to be right and hate every false way. Now, as I have spoken and as I spoke last night and I'll continue to teach, one of the things that you will understand about the kingdom of God is God's kingdom is principle. God's kingdom is not difficult, but it is principle. There are precepts. That's why the teacher taught line upon line and precept upon precept. As we continue to walk in God's ways, not our ways, as we learn to trust in God and not lean to the arm of our own understanding or the arm of the flesh, that's where now the kingdom of God is going to invade every area of your life. I have loved your precepts. See, it's not difficult. The things that Jesus wants you to have, like I said moments ago, he's not hidden them from you. Matter of fact, he takes delight in revealing them to you. And then when you see it, you begin to realize this is the kingdom of God. And none of this other stuff has more power than God's kingdom. Right? You remember Psalms 115? His kingdom rules over all Psalms 103, verse 19, his kingdom, he has established his word above the heavens. His kingdom rules over all. Ladies and gentlemen, what you need to understand is, is those of you that have the simple concept that God is in control of everything, that's where God is in control, where his kingdom rules over all. What he's trying to get you to do is come up higher. He's trying to get you to come up to the precepts of his kingdom so you realize that if that's where rulership is, then if I will live according to his precepts, then the rulership of heaven will flood down through my life, and there I will rule over all. Oh, praise the Lord. Don't, get, don't make me mad now. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And don't shout me down just because I'm preaching good. So he goes on and says, your testimonies, or I esteem your precepts concerning all things to be right. Verse 129, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore does my soul keep them. For the entrance of your words give light and give understanding to the simple. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore does my soul keep them. Well, as we move forward today, I just want to kind of opened the heavens for just a minute by speaking about the understanding of the testimonies. And the testimonies are this. I said it last night. I'll say it again today. Charlie, um, Prophet Charlie talked about the, the testimonies, and I just like the way he defined them. Praise the Lord. Because when you hear a testimony, when you hear a testimony, right? Everybody say, when I hear, when I hear. a testimony. What you should be hearing is, do it again. Do it again. When you hear a testimony, you hear, do it again. So when the individual shares with me the testimony that they had cancer, they've been sick with chemo for weeks and weeks and weeks on end, but they wake up this morning completely free from every symptom. The hardness in their stomach is gone. They haven't felt joy like this in, in years, and now the oppression and depression is released, and they're healed. You say, do it again, God. Right? 
When you hear the testimony, and I prayed yesterday. I told you guys yesterday, I had been praying, praying over the prayer request all day long yesterday. I walked through this building all day, and I knew that there were people that were coming into the room last night that would have a difficult time sitting for the amount of time that God was going to give the word through me. We had an individual here last night that in, in years, year, I'm not talking about a few days, a few weeks because of a little bit of back pain, right? In years had not been able to sit in one place more than 10 to 15 minutes without the pain becoming so excruciating they had to go release themselves. Guess what? They sat through two and a half hours of hearing the word and walked out of here completely free from every bit of pain. Do it again. Right? More and more and more. We had a gentleman that, that, that was here that was having difficulty hearing, and, and, uh, and I don't know the final outcome, but I know what God's Word says. And God's Word is the final outcome. Every person we lay our hands on will recover. God's Word is working. Gentleman was, was deaf, 80% hearing loss in one ear, 90% in the other ear. And, uh, and I believe the wife testified, you know, he, he, he used to talk real loud because he couldn't hear. He walked out here talking in a normal voice last night. Sometimes you don't even know you're healed. Till all of a sudden you realize, huh, well, you know what? That, that pain is gone. Where did it go, people? Jesus took it. He carried it. So I'm going to share with you several quick testimonies, notable miracles, right quick, that I have witnessed myself. Some of you have heard some of these before, but people, some of these you may not have heard. I'm going to start with one of my first mission trips down into the nation of Brazil. People, and I want to say this, I say this to preface it, not because I'm trying to go backwards, but to point to you that as a believer, it doesn't matter how long you've been born again. If you're born again of the Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that dwells in you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And I had only been born again a few years when I took one of my first mission trips into the nation of Brazil. My first mission trip was into Mexico, went down to build uh, 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 some medical facilities down there, and it was more of a work trip. And, uh, and I learned a lot about spiritual warfare on that first trip. But my second trip was one where I had been praying in the Holy Ghost and just seeking God about what to do in my life. And God spoke to me one morning. God spoke to me and said, Philip, you're going to go to Brazil. I said, all right, I'll be happy to go to Brazil, Lord. I had no idea. Now, now, and, and I'll just, I'm, I'm going to take a little sidebar real quick. Now, I get to go to the nations of the world almost every week. I mean, I'm in Pakistan. I'll be in, I'll be in Honduras tomorrow night. I'll be in Pakistan on Tuesday morning. I'll be in Africa. Why? Because of the Internet. Glory to God. And as God is raising up and giving, making those vans. But back then, praise the Lord, you had to go places in order to preach. Amen. And, uh, and so I, the Lord says, Philip, you're going to go to Brazil. I said, all right, Lord, I'll be happy to go. And, uh, and I said, well, when do you want me to go? He said, you're going soon. I said, how am I going to go? Now, at that time, I was young and dumb. Praise the Lord, I shouldn't say that. I was young and didn't have a lot of money. And I said, well, Lord, how am I going to go to Brazil? He said, don't worry about it, I got you. Did I tell you you're going to go? I said, yes, sir. You told me you're going to go. I said, all right. Well, about two weeks after the Lord spoke that I'm going to go to Brazil, I was at an intercessor's conference, a, a conference on prayer and intercession and spiritual warfare, and I was serving. Serving is a key in the kingdom. Praise the Lord. I'm not teaching on ministry of helps now, but serving is a key in the kingdom. Hallelujah. And so I went and I was serving in the ministry. I was serving as an usher in security for this ministry that was doing these, these meetings. And, uh, and so I'm just doing my thing and I'm paying, not really paying much attention except for to make sure all the snot rags are off the floor and the chairs are in a row and, and, uh, and they're to learn and to grow. Praise the Lord. And um, 
it was, I forget exactly which day it was, but like the third day of the conference, and I had just finished my duties of cleaning up and making sure everything was ready and getting ready to reset for the next meeting, and I'm walking down the aisle, and a, a, a woman, I didn't know her, never met her before, she reaches out and puts, shakes my hand, says, hey, just wanted to greet you and say thank you for your service, and she gave me a Pentecostal handshake. Now, at first, I thought it was a prayer request. I thought it was, I thought it was something. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a note, something, something to pray about. Thank you for your prayers. I stuck it in, stuck it in my pocket, I went up to my room to get ready to come back down to the next meeting, reached in my pocket and pulled this thing out, and there was a check for $5,000, and it said Brazil on it. I said, okay, Lord, when do you want me to go? He said, Two weeks. I bought a ticket to Brazil, didn't know anybody. To Rio de Janeiro, didn't know one individual, didn't know one person. One person, right? I get on this airplane, and I'm flying down to Brazil, and now I'm like, oh, pointing over a turn. The Rubicon's been made. I'm, man, I'm, I'm, I'm on the airplane. We're 30,000 feet heading to Rio de Janeiro, and I don't know anybody. What am I going to do when I get there? I don't know. She could a little so fragile. So, bless, no, you, you laugh, but that sowing mysteries, reaping wisdom. So I sat there, well, bless God, in my airplane chair, and I'm sitting there going, She could a little so my love on that Father. Thank you that you show me, you order my steps, you direct my path. God, your word is a light to my feet, a lamp into my path. Holy Spirit, thank you that you instruct me in the way in which I should go. And I was just praying, had my head bound, bound the Holy Ghost, and all of a sudden I feel a tap on my shoulder. I look up, and there's a guy, he said, he said hey, um, I, I, I noticed you're praying. I said, yeah. He said, well, well uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm heading to Rio. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 God just told me to go. He paid for my trip. I'm on this airplane. I don't know anybody. He said, he said, it's crazy. God spoke to me in my conference last week that I'd meet a man. I said, well, he said, just come go with me. He said, we've got all kinds of stuff lined up. So I hooked up. The guy's name was Ricardo Bonfim. And so I hooked up with Ricardo, and he had a team of about 10 or 12 people that were there going down for a short-term mission trip. I was going down to stay until the money ran out. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do, but bless God, I'm going to Brazil to preach the gospel. And, uh, and so I connected with them, and I'm going to share two quick testimonies from it. But remember, do it again. Do it again. So we get to the place where we were staying. We were staying in a place called Niederroy. Which is across, or Niederroy is across the bay from, from uh, Rio de Janeiro, and we, come, and we were actually staying in a little place called Santa Ana. And so we just began to pray in the Holy Ghost, and I said, Well, what are we gonna do? And so, I don't know, let's, let's pray. And we had started having meetings and with translators and different things. The first miracle that happened when I was there was we had, like, the third day. I said, well, I'm, I'm prayed up, and, and I, I don't know what to do, and they had some things that happened. So I said, well, I'm going to go down into Niederroy, and I'm going to go down on the boat docks and preach. And so there was a, there's a ferry that goes right across from the bay, from Rio back into Niederroy. You know, every hour there's ferries that bus people. Um, Rio was about 16 million people back then. And, um, and so... So I'm standing there on the boat docks. I have an interpreter, and I'm preaching, and I'm, we're just sharing the gospel. And people are stopping, listening, and we're giving out tracts, and a few people come. Not great. I, I'm telling you, it wasn't, it wasn't like, whoa, glory to God. God just moved mightily, and everybody that got off the boat got slain in the Holy Ghost. No, we started reaching them one by one with the gospel. And throughout the day, we led about seven or eight people to the Lord Well, the the the, the, the with an interpreter, and it was difficult. I don't mind telling you, it was difficult, but we were walking in obedience to what God said. Well, this is testimony of even what happened last night. The translator had to go. He had somewhere he had to be, and I still had about an hour or so before the van came back to the pickup point to pick me up and take me back. And so I was just walking through the streets, and there was a shop, where they made home or, or handmade leather goods, right? Shoes and pocketbooks and belts and all this kind of stuff. 
And I walk in there, and nobody in the room spoke English. And I didn't speak Portuguese. And so I'm looking around, and, but I had my Bible. I had my Bible in my hand. And I said, do you have a Bible? She said, yeah. So she pulls out a Bible from her, from her um, uh, out from under her desk. And so I led her in scriptures, and I said, read this. And she read. And then I said, well, read this. And she read it. And then I said, read this. And she read it. And she was reading it out loud. And after the fifth scripture, you could feel a wind blow into that shop. And all of a sudden, they all fell to the ground and began to weep in the presence of God. And I stood there and went, well, I guess your word's working, God. And I walked out because I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't communicate with him, but God could. God is able to speak by his word. Why do I say that, people? It is God's word. Well, several weeks later, we were in uh, Rio, and Rick, uh, Dr. Bonfim asked me to preach, to teach. Now, people remember, I'm relatively young. I'm a, I'm a young believer, four, four or five years old, as, as, a, as, a, as a man who's been born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and so he asked me to preach. Well, I go in and I preach, and the message I preach is out of Matthew chapter 16. The reason it's the message I preach, it was the first revelation, revelation that God gave me. Okay. Emphasis, revelation. Because what I'm going to share with you at the end of today is a revelation. Because that thing that is revealed belongs unto you. Glory to God. So, Matthew chapter 16 was a revelation that God had given me about the church, who the church is, the power of the church, how the gates of hell would not prevail against it. I didn't know anybody that was teaching what I was teaching at that particular time, how God had raised up and established a government in the earth called the church, the ecclesia. And when they operated in that governmental authority, there wasn't a decision that hell made that could stop God's word from being performed in the earth. So I had preached this message this night. It was in downtown Rio. It was on the seventh floor of a high-rise building, and we were there, and, and, and uh, about 600 people were in there that night. A bunch of people got saved. We had prayed for a bunch of people to get healed and delivered as God's word was working. And I get off of the, I, I finished the meeting. It's, it's probably 10 o'clock or so at night, and it's raining outside. Get on the elevator. Me and the team, we get on the elevator. We come down and we hit ground floor. As we hit ground floor, I'm standing there and we're waiting for the van to come and pick us up. So we're standing there under the shadow. The streets are wet. The sidewalks are there. And like a city street, it had overhangs as people came down the sidewalks. Well, I'm standing there just waiting and I'm looking, looking at traffic. The team's all around. We're tired. I'm sweaty. It was hot. We had prayed for a bunch of people. And, uh, and as I look to my left, there's a woman walking down the sidewalk. And she's walking down the sidewalk with her son. Her son was a deaf and dumb mute. Her son, unlike normal Brazilians, but many times like an individual who has that condition, he was a little bit larger. He was an individual, he was a little bit larger than the average Brazil, Brazilian, and he, and he was walking, and mom had him by the shoulder, and she was walking him, and he was kind of just lumbering along, had that dumb and deaf look in his eyes. And I looked at him, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God says, cast the devil out of him. I said, all right. And as soon as the Lord said that, I know what happened to me because the anointing, the fire of God came upon me, and as I looked at him, all of a sudden, this kind of lumbering giant, kind of uncoordinated individual walking all of a sudden, he saw my eyes, and all of a sudden, he stood upright and came at me and had his fist up like this, ready to fight. So he was from, when he locked eyes with me, he was about from Chad to me, and with Chad sitting to me, and all of a sudden, he locked eyes, and he started coming. He picked up his face and just started, I mean, had his shoulders back like this, and I, ah, ah, it's the devil. 
No. I didn't run from that thing. I locked eyes with him, and I said, you foul devil, I bind you in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden, this guy went like this, this, spun around twice, fell on his back. Cast the devil out of him. He got up off of the ground. God had loosed his tongue. He could speak. He could hear for the first time in his life, completely made right in his mind. People, God is God. Testimony, do it again. Completely delivered, completely set free. We were back in that same church the next week preaching, and that woman with her son was sitting there on the third row, and he was there in his right mind and gave testimony. I had never spoken, could not read, and could not hear, but here I am. I can read. I can understand. Why? Because it was a devil from hell trying to rob a young man of his destiny. I'm here to tell you tonight, whatever's trying to rob you of your destiny, God hates it. Glory to God. Oh, but he was born that way. So? So? Who cares? God is the author of life. He is the one that sets captives free, and God is going to move tonight. One more quick testimony. I, I, I got plenty, but again, two, well, let's go to two more. Praise the Lord. I love telling these stories because, people, it glorifies Jesus. Because it didn't have nothing to do with me. had everything to do with I just was a worshiper of God. That I was learning to know him and know his word and know his ways. There back in Columbus, Georgia, this is another testimony that happened there. That I was a part of a, a Bible study that, that was out of our church undercover, in order, praise the Lord. I'll leave that alone, but for those of you who have an ear to hear, hear, praise the Lord. And so we were there, and, and, and me and a couple of other young men would, 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 would get together on a regular basis in our house just to worship and praise. Uh, I, I, I've taught some of the guys here about some of the things that we came up with, one of which is called ricochet witnessing. Praise the Lord. Ricochet witnessing is letting God's word work in any circumstance. In other words, if you'll talk God's word, God will perform his word. He'll use his word to awaken people. But anyhow, this particular night, we were there, and we were just praying and worshiping God and getting into the word. And, uh, and so we had, had probably about, I don't know, 10 or 15 people that had come that night. And uh, this was a, a small townhouse-type condominium, not a very big living room area. And so it was full. I mean, you, you put 15 people in most of your living rooms, and it gets full pretty quick, right? Even if you got a big house, 15 people in one room, you know, trying to sit on the furniture. Well, this was not a big house. This was a small uh, a condominium type townhouse and so the dining room table was full the couch was full the chairs were full there were a bunch of people sitting on the floors and so I had had gone up and just sat on the stairs because there were stairs that went up and so I was sitting on about the fourth stair up it had a banister that went down I could see into the living room and we're just praying we got worship going on and uh, those of you who who can go back that far we had Phil Driscoll yeah. glory to God Play and I exalt thee. Amen. Now, I, pray, I don't know if that was on or not, but, but that was like the song back then, you know, praise God and, and worship. And, and we were just worshiping, but the presence of God was thick, 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 thick. And so we're just sitting there worshiping God, and all of a sudden, like I said, I'm sitting on the stairs. And like many of these times, I'm just trying to paint the picture for you. Like many of these townhouses are, you come in the front door and three or four steps forward, and then it goes up the stairs to the upstairs bedrooms, or you go into the living room in the area. So I'm sitting on the stairs kind of right, you know, 10 feet, 8 feet, whatever it is from the front door, and all of a sudden I hear. And so everybody else is worshiping. So I get up, go to the door. I wasn't expecting anybody, didn't know anybody. I open the door. And as I opened the door, I stood, and there was an individual standing in front of me. Did not know them, never seen them before. 
Matter of fact, at that very instance, I could not tell you what they looked like because instantly I was in the spirit. There was an individual standing in front of me, and I did not see one physical feature, but it was like looking at a medical uh, uh, dummy, not a dummy, but a medical structure uh, uh, of an anatomy and physiology, right, with a person without any skin on their body. And as I looked at them, I could see every organ, I could see every bone, I could see everything moving. And as I looked, there was a black spot in the, in the breast. There were, there were areas that were in one of the breasts, and the, the, the uh, ovaries and fallopian tubes were exact, completely black. I didn't know this individual. Never seen him before in my life. And I look, I look, and they, they're standing there in front of me, and I remember... reaching out my hand. And as I reached out my hand, she put her hand in mine, and when she did, all of a sudden, everything that was dead in her began to come to life. The spot in the breast dissolved, the, the lumps, everything that was there, and I watched the ovaries come into living color and the fallopian tube come into living color. And next thing I know, she's in the house and the presence of God is lifting and people are all over the place. God himself had stepped into the room. She is there on the floor, and all of a sudden the people are like, man, what? It's almost, I don't know how else to explain it, but it was like a time warp. Time went by, but nobody knew it. Something happened. Something had transpired, but people were not able to mark it on their clocks. It was, it was not something that you could know in the natural. It happened supernaturally. But it was like everybody in the room for an instant was in a trance as God did a work. Something supernatural occurred. I have no idea how much time or whatever happened, but be because time is no essence in eternity. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the primary principles, remember, precept. Now faith is. The only word in the English language that's connected to eternity is now. God is always now. Well, that girl had a now moment with heaven, a word from heaven. And so as, as she was there and as, as, as the atmosphere began to shift to where people recognized we were still in this Bible study, this girl looks up and she looks around and I'm watching her. She has this look of shock on her face like, where am I? And so I asked her, well, she actually spoke first. She said, where am I? And I said, well, this is, this is 3705 Bridgewater Road. You're, and, and she said, what? I said, yeah, you're up off, off, off exit six, airport throughway. And come, she said, how did I get here? I said, I, I don't know. All I know is this. And I said, stop. I said, before you say another word, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what I saw. This is what I saw. When I began to describe to her, when I reached out my hand and the power of God and those things that were dead coming to life again, she began to weep uncontrollably. She said, you don't understand. She says, the last thing I remember is I just left the doctor down off of exit one, Victory Drive. And the doctor told me that I have breast cancer and that my ovaries are dead and I'll never be able to bear children. I'm 21 years old and I've never had a menstrual cycle. I said, well, all I know is that by the power of God, that which was in your breast is gone. I saw it be removed and I saw your ovaries come into living color and your fallopian tubes completely healed. And she just wept and wept and wept and wept. Well, we, we went on, and, and, and she talked about, well, who are you? How do you get here? And we, we were all amazed at the fact that there was a knock on the door. She had no idea who drove her, how she got there, but she was driving her own car. So 20 minutes or so go by, and we're all kind of rejoicing and thinking, wow, this was crazy. What's going on here? And, uh, and all of a sudden, she, she gets up and excuses herself to go to the restroom. And next thing you know, you hear, and so one of the girls that was there goes and knocks on the door, everything okay, everything okay? And she said, I'm having a menstrual cycle. She started for the first time. 
Now, people, we laugh at that, but to somebody that is faced with certain death in their body, certain death in their body, and God raises that from the dead. Right? All of a sudden, these things begin to unfold. And what I want you to understand today, I don't care what the doctor said is dead in you. I don't care what they have decreed is not working or does not work properly. I'm here to tell you, glory to God, the power of God is present to heal. So anyway, we started a friendship with this young lady. She got saved, got filled with the Holy Ghost, glory to God, completely healed by the power of God. I saw her about a year and a half later on one of the college university campuses. She was married and pregnant. Praise God. Amen. I, I got many more. We'll try to tie time in, but I don't want too much time to get away from us this morning. Glory to God. So what am I saying? God, your testimonies are sure. You have a more sure word of prophecy. Your testimonies are a wonder to me. Every time I hear a testimony, God, my heart cries out, do it again. When I hear of the, of the testimonies that are coming in from Pakistan on a weekly basis, people, it's astounding to me that people who do not know me, you're not in, in their presence, but you're preaching through a computer into a remote village in some uh, distant plan in, in Pakistan where they're hearing the word through an interpreter. And all of a sudden, a man who's been lame for 20 years gets up and begins to walk. A woman whose arm was busted and broken all of a sudden stretches it out. People that had infections in their jaws, all of a sudden the infection leaves and God heals their teeth. I say that to say, people, with God, all things are possible and nothing is possible to those who believe. What's the difference? The difference is, people, it's the gospel of the kingdom. And what you need to understand is, is God's word is working whether you like it or not. Now, there is an a, a, a application because the Bible does say it will be done unto you according to your faith. And that's why I spent two and a half hours last night hitting the spirit of unbelief. Hitting that thing in you that's blinded your minds. Hitting that thing to show you, I don't care who you are, it is God's will for you to be perfectly whole. It is God's will for you to be made free from whatever it is. Hallelujah. So the testimonies of Jesus. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4. And I'm going to try to get through a couple of these real quick. Glory to God. I feel good. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 4. Hallelujah. And verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, preach and say, preach and say. Remember, as believers, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, for with the heart man believes. Jesus began to preach and say, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I taught this on Sunday morning a couple of weeks ago. Change your attitudes and your actions because there is an invasion of the Holy Spirit that's imminent in your life. There's an imminent invasion of your miracle. There's an imminent move of God that God has designed just for you. And as long as you will get your mindset aligned with God's mindset, you can have what God says you can have. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
We talked about it. We understand it. We realize that the Bible says clearly, Proverbs chapter 4, that not only did God send his word to heal them, but if you will attend to his sayings and pay attention to his words, that his words are health and healing to all of their flesh that as a believer God's word is medicine and if you pray God's kingdom come his will be done then you have the full right and authority to recognize that God's kingdom is void of sickness disease infirmity oppression depression fear anxiety or any other such thing so Jesus simply says repent change your attitudes and your actions for the kingdom of heaven is at hand you drop down to verse 23, and so Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and doing what? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every manner of sickness and every manner of disease except the one you have. Well, no, went about healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. Did not leave anything undone. All manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. He healed them all. There was not one that walked away from that gathering that was not transformed by the word of God and completely free from sickness and disease. I said it last night. I'll say it again now. You need to understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ includes your healing as much as it does your salvation. It includes your physical man as much as it does your spirit man. It includes not only the forgiveness of your sins like we closed last night. What is easier to say? Your sins be forgiven or rise up, take up your bed and walk. If you'll hear God's word, God's word works. So you say, well, pastor, this is Jesus. Yeah, I know it's Jesus. I understand that we're talking about Jesus. But the Bible tells us, and we're going to see how Jesus transferred that power onto us. And the same power that he exercised, the same authority, the same anointing. Everybody say same. same. Not different, same. The same anointing, same power that he operated in over every sickness, over every disease, and over every infirmity is the same power that works in us. Why? Because people, I didn't save myself, he saved me. I didn't come to live in me, he came to live in me. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So understand these principles because, you know, when we look with our natural eyes, we see things as impossible or, or at, at a minimum improbable. But God's telling you, I didn't come to show you with your natural eyes. I came to show you by my spirit. And those things that are revealed belong to you. When the word of God comes, they belong unto you. Glory to God. Why am I spending this time? Because when you understand the power of revelation and recognize that God has not hidden things from you, glory to God, sometimes it seems like he hid them for us, but I'm here to tell you, God, by the Holy Ghost, wants you to see it, so when you see it, you can have it. There's not one person in here that got born again, that got born again without seeing their need for salvation. There's not one person in here that got forgiven of their sins without seeing their own personal need to get forgiven of their sins. Because there are millions and millions of people that believe in God. That doesn't mean they're born again. Those who are born again see the kingdom. They recognize that through the forgiveness of sins, God has opened unto them the realm, not only the realm of his kingdom, but people, it's not just fire insurance and a one-way ticket to heaven. It is God's power working in your life so that you can overcome every. Now, people, I'm here to tell you, I w and, and I'm, a, I'm encouraging you throughout this morning, even as I'm preaching, when you see it, take it. 
take it by force. Whatever it is that you've been believing God for. See, some of you might like, well, well, I was waiting for the pastor to lay hands on me. I'm going to lay hands on everybody that wants their hands laid on. But you don't have to wait for me to lay my hands on you. Why? Because the hand of God is present. God's hand is in our midst. I'm going to show you. You're going to see it. I'm telling you, you're going to see it. I prophesy, you're going to see it. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 8. Go over a couple of passages. We're going to look at Jesus in a couple of more places. Praise the Lord. And I'll try to move quickly. Matthew chapter 8. This is Peter's. And Jesus has now just dealt with the centurion. Excuse me. And uh, the centurion has sent for Jesus to come heal his servant that lies at home with a fever that's dying. My servant is at home, sick of a palsy and grievously tormented. Sick of a palsy and grievously tormented. Having seizures, tormented by the devil. And Jesus says these words in verse 7, I will. I will come and heal him. Now, people, I remind you of the word from Acts chapter 4. God is no respecter of persons. I will come and heal him. People, I will come and heal you. I will. I will. I will come and heal him. I will come. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you would come under my roof, but speak what? The word only, and my servant shall be healed. Speak the word only, for I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goes. I say to another man, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard the reply of the centurion's understanding of faith, Speak the word only because I too am a man under authority. When I say to one, go, he goes. To another, come, he comes. And to another one, do this and do it. The Bible says at that very moment, Jesus marveled and said unto those that followed him. You need to learn from this guy. He understands some things. He recognizes a precept, a principle. He understands that this is how this works. I've not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. For many will come unto me from the east and the west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. However, the children of the kingdom, they'll be cast out in the outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, what? As you have believed, as you have believed, so be it done unto you. Well, I want you to understand that it's God's will for everyone to be healed, but everyone will not be healed because everyone will not believe. And that's what he was talking about. He said, look, even the children of the kingdom, many of them will be in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They'll live under the oppression of the devil because they've not come to the place to understand the principle and see. This man said, speak the word only. He understands. All I have to do is say, go, and it goes. All right. Get ready, because in just a little while, when we pray for some people, we're going to tell some stuff to go. We're going to tell some other stuff to come. We're going to speak to some other things and say, do this, and it'll do it. Oh, hear me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the kingdom of God. See, there's some stuff that needs to leave, but there's some stuff that needs to come. There are people in this room that you need new organs. It needs to come. Right? There are other people in this room that maybe there's a disease and it needs to be cut off from its root and it needs to go. Praise the Lord. There are others in this room that need to understand that sometimes in the principle, as a servant, he's saying, go, do this, 
and in your doing, you will be healed. Oh, don't forget about the blind men, I mean the, the lepers, excuse me. And he said, go and show yourself to the priest. And in their going, they were healed. Praise the Lord. Only one returned. And the one who returned wasn't just healed because all ten of them were healed. But the one who returned was made whole. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. We've heard it taught here before. Pastor David taught it one time years ago. But you understand the disease of leprosy, recognizing that leprosy is a deterioration of the flesh and the bones. It begins to eat things away. And so out of all of those ten lepers, they might have been missing some fingers and some toes. They might have been missing, been missing some stuff off of their body that this flesh-eating bacteria had completely destroyed. And so when they went their way to show themselves to the priest, the leprosy was gone, but it didn't mean their fingers grow back. The one that came back, he was whole. So what I want you to understand tonight is do not underestimate the power of God to make a man whole. Hallelujah. So he goes on down in Matthew chapter 8, and he says unto the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so be it done unto you. Verse 14, and so Jesus then came into Peter's mother's house, and there, glory to God, <clears throat> let's see where we're at, Amen. Um, he raised up Peter's mother, who was sick of a fever, right? Touched her hand. The fever left her. She arose. Verse 16. And when the evening had come, they brought unto Jesus many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed the sick. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed the sick. Now, I'm going to get into something here in just a minute that's going to help you understand casting out a spirit. We know a person can be demonically oppressed, depressed, or possessed by a demon spirit, but there is such a thing as a spirit of infirmity. And one of the things that you're going to find is, is that when Jesus used his word, he cut off spirits of infirmity, their right to exist in another man's body. The spirit didn't mean that the individual was growling and foaming at the mouth and like the demoniac of Gadara, we'll touch that one in a few minutes. Didn't mean that the man was full of legions and, 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 uh, and lost his mind as the schizophrenic on the side of the road talking to voices that are in the air. No, a spirit of infirmity is the life of a disease that exists within a man or a woman. Praise the Lord. Follow me for just a minute. Because every disease has a life of itself. Oh, hallelujah. People in the earth fear COVID because it's a virus. There's a life force that's in that virus. That life force is a spirit of infirmity. Cancer, right? is a pollution in the blood, but that pollution has a life of its own, and if it's not dealt with, it will continue to grow and to multiply. It's a spirit of infirmity. It has a breath or a life of its own. Arthritis and the deterioration of joints, it is a spirit of infirmity. I didn't say you're pest possessed with the devil. I said there's a spirit of infirmity that has attacked your body, and there's something that is living on the inside of you, multiplying itself because it was sent from hell to destroy you and to stop you from living a full life as God created you to live. So we have to understand this because people, this, this is not, we're, we're not here to have church as normal. We're not here to, well, praise God. Hallelujah. No, we're here to deal with this stuff. Right? And so here, Jesus, what does it say in verse 16? When they came, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, he cast out the spirits with his word and healed. 
Oh, it doesn't say some. A few select few. It doesn't say those who earned it and deserved it. It doesn't say those that showed up to Bible study. No, he healed all, all that were sick. So what? So that it might be fulfilled. That which was, oh, don't underestimate the word. Don't under, see, you're sitting here under the word tonight, this morning, praise the Lord, like you were last night, so that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken. That which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, himself took our infirmities. Himself bore our sicknesses. Glory to God, right? Himself took our infirmities. Himself bore our sicknesses. And when Jesus then saw this great multitude coming about him, he gave commandment to go to the other side. And a certain scribe came unto him and said unto him, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus goes on through that. Matthew chapter 11. Real quick, one scripture and then to Matthew 12. And then I'm going to shift because I don't want to keep you here all day. But I'm going to keep you till you get, get what you came to get. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, one, one of the... Um, principles that we have discovered, and many of you may have had similar experiences, but good things come to those who wait. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because those who wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Glory to God. So Matthew chapter 11, and uh, let me just look at this one passage real quick. I got several of it written down. Hallelujah. Came to pass when Jesus uh, had made an end of commanding the 12 disciples. What did he do? Well, Matthew chapter 10 is where he gave them power over all the power of the enemy and told them to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom. And so after he had finished commanding them and had given them understanding of what that meant, he departed there to go what? Teach and preach in their cities. That's Matthew 11 and 1. When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Are you he that should come or should we look for another? Jesus merely answered and said, Go and show John again the things which you do hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he whoever shall not be offended in me. Now, I want you to put your eyes on the passage there that it says the dead are raised up. Because so many times, uh, Nick, will you bring me a tissue real quick? I need to blow my nose. Excuse me just a second. Yeah. All right. So many times as believers, we want to jump to go into a graveyard and raising somebody from the dead. The dead are raised up. But what we realize is, is that 95% other than Lazarus who had been dead four days, most of the dead who were raised up were people that were under the influence of some kind of disease or sickness that had just taken their last breath. And Jesus raised them from the dead. But I want to back up a little bit before that. Because what you recognize is everybody in this room, everybody in this room, in the earth, is still subject to death. 
It's appointed for every man wants to die. But what you need to understand is just because you're subject to death doesn't mean death has the right to take you. And God will raise up the dead. In other words, there might be areas in your life that have been declared dead. Maybe you have a joint that just doesn't work anymore, and you own a cross. You own a cane, and that joint is dead. People, God will raise that thing from the dead. Maybe you got something that's working in you. I'm here to tell you, people, it is the power of God to raise people up. We don't have to wait to. The Bible tells us even though we're in the world, we're not of it. And even though we're in the world and our bodies are decaying because of the law and sin and death, because you're born again, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus triumphs over that law. Therefore, in your flesh, you do not have to succumb to it, but as your days are, so shall your strength be. How many of you know the man by the name of Charles Caps? Praise the Lord. Many of you know who Charles Caps is. If you don't, you should get familiar with him. Why do you say that? Well, Charles Caps has gone on to be with the Lord, but Charles Caps, like Kenneth Hagin, was a man that God began to teach the principles of faith. He got a hold of the word, and the word began to transform him. And through the transforming power of God's word, that which was dead began to come to life again. And he began to teach messages on how faith works and the power of the tongue and the creative power that's in the tongue. This man began to believe God and learn how to believe God, and his, his teachings are full of understanding the principles of faith. He began to talk to his farm. He began to talk to his land. He began to talk to his cattle. He began to speak to it, and it would obey him. He began to speak to his business. He began to speak to his body. He began. Now, people, he didn't do it overnight. He learned it, but he recognized the creative power of God is on my tongue. The power of life and death is on my tongue. I'm going to eat the fruits of what I say. Well, Charles Capps went to heaven. I forget exactly how long ago. Do you know when it was? It was within the last decade. Within the last decades, Charles Capps moved to heaven. But the thing I love about Charles Capps, testimony, what's testimony mean? Yes. Say it like you believe it. Yes. Say it like an army. Yes. Charles Capps' testimony was what? Charles Capps was strong. He was in his 80s when he went home to be with the Lord. But people, he was 100% healthy. He was like Caleb. His strength was not abated. He was at 80-something at years old, perfectly, I mean, healthy as an ox, could outwork himself when he was 18. His youth being renewed like the eagles, his clear eyes, his clear ears. I mean, you, you watch his teachings in the last days, and he looked just as strong as he did when I first heard him 35 years ago. Powerful, strong. And watch what happened to his testimony. So here's a man who's learned the power of life and death on his tongue. Here's a man who's learned the principles of faith. Here's a man who's learned to understand that the resurrection power of Christ that dwelled in him had effect in every area of his life. So his testimony was he was praying one Saturday morning, and the Lord told him, Charles, you're coming home tomorrow. He's perfectly healthy. Nothing wrong. He said, all right, Lord, I'm ready. And so what did he do? He goes and tells his wife, says, honey, I'm going home tomorrow. What do you mean you're going home? No, I'm going home. God's taking me. It's my, my days are over. My work is finished. Called the children. So he called the children. He had grown children, their families, his grandchildren, brings them all over to the house. They have a great meal. They enjoy their time together. He lays hands on every one of them, prays over them, blesses them, speaks the word of God over him, and he goes to heaven. Without suffering, without sickness, without disease, without pain, without any of those sort of things, he went in Christ. 
He went in the anointing. Testimony means what? As your days are, so shall your strength be. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing impossible for God, and all things are possible to those who believe. The creative working, miracle working power of God is available. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 12. I'm, I'm moving quick now. Glory to God. Verse 9. When Jesus departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man in the synagogue who had a withered hand. Right? He had a withered hand, and they asked Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? Jesus said, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if the sheep were to fall in a pit on the Sabbath day, would he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much more then is a man better than a sheep? Where do you mean, wherefore is it lawful to do, or wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? And Jesus said to the man, other hand wither. No. Stretch out your hand. I couldn't help myself. I, I need a little comic relief for myself. Praise the Lord. Stretch it forth, and it was what? Restored whole. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going somewhere with this this morning. It was restored whole. Testimony. Anything that's withered, anything that's deteriorated, anything that's not functioning as originally designed, stretch it forth. God will make it whole. Whatever it is. People I know that there are people that need absolute creative miracles. And I'm here to tell you, I can't do one of them, but Jesus already did. He sent his word to heal you. And this is the hour that we're going to step into that anointing in Christ. And God is going to make it whole like the other. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 6. There's a lot more in Matthew 9, but I'm not going to go to it just because I want to move here. Hallelujah. Man, the word is wonderful. The word is so powerful. The word, I mean, I'm, I, I, don't, I had, a, I had a, 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 I'm falling in love with the word over and over and over again. The more I read it, the more I see, and the more I see, the more I hear, and the more I hear, the more I see, and the more I see, the more I hear. The more I hear, the more I see, and the more I hear, and the more I see. Somebody got that. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 6. Hallelujah. Is this it? Verse 17 and following Luke chapter 6. They came down with him. He came down with them and stood in the plain. The company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem from the seacoast to Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him. They came to hear him. They came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. They came to and be healed of their diseases. They came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those that were vexed with unclean spirits, they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him for virtue or power went out of him and he healed them okay so ladies and gentlemen again what I'm after what God's after is that all I want today that there not be one person that's in this room that leaves without receiving the full manifestation of God's word in your life Heal them all. And it doesn't matter what, again, they have said. It does not matter what prognosis, diagnosis, or any of that sort of thing is. Why? Because God's word is greater. 
God exalted even his word above his name. Glory to God. Now, I'm not going to go to it, but you could go to Luke chapter 8, and you'll see the woman with the issue of blood and how God called her. And when she was healed, he then told her to tell somebody. Luke 13, though, I want to jump on this one, and then we're going to shift, if I can. Everybody okay today? Anybody tired? You need to stand up and stretch or praise the Lord. We'll take a break here in just a minute, and then I'm going to share the vision with you. Glory to God. And I'll go ahead and tell you, we're going, we're going to receive an offering this morning when we take the break. Praise the Lord. We didn't receive an offering last night. We don't, you guys know we don't normally do that as far as that goes because it, it's not about that. Praise God. But we're going to do it today because God wants to give you an opportunity to sow into the word. Luke chapter 13, verse 11. I spoke on this just a second ago, but I want to deal with this um, idea for just a couple of minutes before we then begin to move into the next portion. Luke chapter 13, verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity and was bowed together for 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he said unto her, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. Now, the reason that I wanted to hit on this for just a minute is, is because a lot of times when we read that this woman had a spirit of infirmity, again, you feel like it's some woman that's walking around and, and, and growling all the time, you know, bent over, I hate you, yeah. right? No, this woman had scoliosis, bad, a disease in her bones. She was bowed over. She had that possibly whatever that is. It was a spirit of infirmity. Other than that, she was in her natural mind. She loved Jesus. She was going about life as normal as she could, but her life had been robbed from her because there was a spirit of infirmity that was destroying her quality of life. Eighteen years she had been bowed over. She had been dealing with chronic pain, chronic issues. It was there. It existed. It had her bound. And Jesus said, woman, thou art loosed from your infirmity. Well, what I want you to understand today is, is like I said when I talked just a minute ago about the centurion and faith, he said, listen, I say to one, go and he goes, to another, come and he comes. And today when we lay hands on some of you, Literally, what we're going to do is cut off the spirit of infirmity's right to continue in your body. And you will find when you go away from here, you're whole. Not because I said it, because God said it. Not because I did it, but because the anointing is upon you to separate you from whatever it is that the enemy has used to destroy you. Remember, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He's a murderer, he's a liar, and he wants to separate you from a quality of life, from a destiny, from your ability to live. But I'm here to tell you, whether it's cancer or arthritis or diabetes or whatever that disease is, a disease is a spirit of infirmity. And Jesus came to set some captives free. And Jesus is in the midst. Blindness, deafness, spirits of infirmity. Be thou loosed. The deaf heard, the dumb spoke, the blind saw, the lame were made whole, the maimed were delivered and set free. Glory to God. So I just say that to say that, see, one of the things that begins to happen in the prayer of faith is literally the authority of God's word to sever the life source of a disease in the life of a body and replace it with the 
the redemptive power of God. All right, let's look at this real quick as I, as I shift. Every disease, every disease, every disease, every disease comes because of some sort of blood born malfunction. What do I mean? Cancer is blood out of order. Arthritis, what is it? Your bones begin to dry up because the marrow, the blood, is now affected. Amen. Heart disease, chronic uh, uh, obstructive heart failure, right? What, what, what's that called? Or, or, or lung disease. Every one of these things comes. Any infection, any disease is literally because of the blood. Luke, I mean, uh, Leviticus chapter 17 and 11 says, the life is in the blood. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are blood washed, born again, have the Redeemer. We said it last night. I have found a ransom for you. It's the blood of Jesus. His name is Jesus. And when the blood of Jesus is applied to whatever is working in your life, it severs the right of a disease to live in your body. Well, Pastor, if that's the way it happens, how come it hadn't already happened? Because you haven't believed it. Now, don't get mad at me. Praise the Lord. That's why we're here. We're here to help you. Well, I believe. I know you believe, but we're here. And the anointing is here. And Jesus is here. And we are binding and breaking the power. And I'm telling you today, right now, be loosed from your infirmity. Be loosed from arthritis. Be loosed from cataracts. Be loosed from the ringing in your ears. It's a spirit of infirmity. Be loosed. Now, there are creative miracles, and we're going into that in, our, in this next session. But people, I'm here to tell you, God wants you free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I know that you guys, and thank you come, for coming out. But I'm telling you, people, there's no substitute for God's word. There is no substitute for you hearing God's word. Everywhere that Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, miracles began to break out like popcorn. Pop, 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 pop. Pop, 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 pop. All over the place. So the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. And so the spirit of infirmity is severed from its life source when we pray the prayer of faith. See, there are, uh, uh, again, there are individuals. And people, you have to understand, this is, a, this is a biblical principle. I'm not trying to manufacture something. This is how it works. Jesus said to the woman with, with, uh, that had the spirit of infirmity, be thou loosed, and immediately, immediately, she was loosed from her infirmity. Loosed from it. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'll be the first one to tell you, as God begins to bring forth his word and people get set free, the world is going to fight you on it. But that's not the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to go to the doctor. You're supposed to spend all your money on physicians. Oh, that's the woman with the issue of blood. Remember, she spent all her money on physicians. Jeremiah said, cursed is the man that trusts in the arm of the flesh, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. In other words, people, God is not bound by and God is not limited by some sort of medical profession. God is not limited by the marvels of science and technology. God does not need for you to go get an artificial replacement when he can replace it himself. Is that right? Come on now. Do I have any believers in this room? See, that's what we're after. We're, we're, we're not after, we're not after uh, uh, going to medicine and spending all of your money 
on something that may or may not work or looking to the arm of flesh. And people thank God for what the doctors do. Thank God for the technology. Thank God for the advancements. And we agree that all healing comes from God. But God is God, always will be God, always has been God. And his word is still the most powerful source on all of creation in every realm and in every dimension. And his word still has the power to create and form and make new. Are, are you following me? Because I realize that, you know, we, we've become so dependent. I, 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 we, we've been in the places, you know, when somebody has a, 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 um, what's, what's the, a procedure in front of them. And so they'll gather their friends around and say, well, will you pray for me? I hear it all the time. Oh, sure, we'll pray for you. Lord, give them peace and guide the surgeon's hands. Well, praise God, give them peace and guide the surgeon's hands. Be it done unto you according to your faith. How about in the name of Jesus, spirit infirmity, get your hands off of them. In the name of Jesus, I decree by the authority of the blood of Jesus who gave all life to man, be healed. Right? The woman with the issue of blood spent all her money on physicians and yet still grew nothing better. But she said within herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. She kept saying, why, why did she kept saying within herself? Because she heard. She heard how others were healed, how others were delivered. She heard about everywhere that Jesus went. Lame people were walking. Blind eyes were opening. She said to herself, what is this? And to whoever touched the hem of his garment were made whole. Amen. Praise the Lord. A couple more scriptures and I'm going to give us a quick break and then I'm going to come back. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 4. Just so you see this, just so you see this, Just so you see this, you say, Pastor, yeah, that's great. But you know, that was Jesus, and he was the Son of God. I mean, you know, he, he is, he is, I mean, he was God in the flesh. Amen, and who are you? Well, Pastor, now, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, what, what do you mean, who am I? For this purpose is the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon those that love him, that they might be called what? Oh, that you're called the Son of God. Who are you? What is man that God is mindful of him and the son of man that God will visit him? For God has made him a little lower than Elohim, crowned him with glory and honor, and given him dominion over all the works of his hands. Didn't Jesus say when he was accused of being God, he said, haven't you read in the Psalms that I have said you are God's? Not to say that you are God, but you have power and authority over your own stuff at a minimum. Praise the Lord. But this is Jesus, the Son of God. And who are you? People, when you come into the anointing, when you walk with God, God's anointing is transferred. That's exactly what he said to the disciples in Mark chapter 16. Not only do I give you power over all the power of darkness, Matthew 28, but what did he say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. To he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You will, and these signs will follow those that believe. believe. They'll lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. I'm here to tell you today, every person I lay my hands on will recover. Well, that's pretty bold. I know. But I didn't say it. I'm just saying what he said. I'll cast out devils. Well, bless God. 
Who gave you that authority? Jesus, and I'm going to separate some spirits of infirmity from some of your lives today, and you're going to find that things that didn't get better for a long time all of a sudden started getting better. There's going to be strength. There's going to be energy. There's going to be health. There's going to be absolutely supernatural recovery. You're going to find creative miracles working. All of a sudden, that mobility begins to increase. Whatever it is. People, there is no limit with God. Praise the Lord. All right, hold on with me for just a minute. So Acts chapter 4, did I tell you to go there? Hallelujah. Amen. I'm preaching better than you guys are shouting, but that's all right. I know I, know I kept you a long time last night. But people, you have to understand there is no substitute for this word. None whatsoever. Acts chapter 4, quickly. Verse 8 and following, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we're examined of the good deed which was done unto this impotent man, and by what means he is made whole, be it none known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, yet God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand whole before you today. And we're going to come back in just a second and deal with the name, and then I'm going to take you into the, into the vision. But what I want you to understand is here. What I've talked to you about so far up until this point in miracle healing, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead. And the reason that I want to make this point before I close this segment is it is all in the resurrection power of God, whom God raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of all creation. Oh, glory to God. We're going to get into some creative miracles. I feel the anointing on that one. Glory to God. He's the first fruit of all creation. Because God raised him from the dead, he'll raise you from the dead too. And people, I'm not talking about at the end of this time. I'm talking about today. Whatever's dead shall be raised to life again. Creative power moving and flowing in you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. As the revelation becomes stronger and stronger in your heart, in your spirit, of the things that Jesus has already provided for you. It's our desire that <clears throat> as your heart opens, you begin to receive the power to manifest the word that you have believed. Because I want to reiterate that it's not me that does the work. It's Jesus. It's the anointing. He's anointed me, but it's the anointing that does the work. Hallelujah. So let's kind of press back in here for just a second and we're going to go quickly. I um, want to get to the vision because I believe with all of my heart, God wants to show you who he is. He wants to show you who he is. Jesus, we honor your name. Thank you. Thank you, Father, that you are not only able and willing, but, Father, you will do it. As we have received a more sure word of prophecy, we recognize and know that the testimonies 
of God are sure. And Father, as your testimonies, as we hear of the works, as we hear of the miracles, as we hear of the good news, we thank you that as our hearts resound with a loud, do it again, that God, we step into that miraculous manifestation of the fulfillment of your word. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that your word will continue to have free course this morning. Thank you that every hear, ear that is here will hear and come to understanding. That revelation will continue to unfold. That, Father, as we have already said, the path that you have set them on to their complete and total victory will shine brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, and brighter unto the fullness of day. Thank you, Jesus, that you are God and there is none else. And Lord, we declare it, we decree it, you are my God, you are my King, you are my Lord, you are my Master. And according to you word, your word, you are the Lord that healeth me. We give you praise and thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. So real quick, I want to go with, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I need to get into the vision. <clears throat> I didn't mean to take the amount of time that I did, but I, I pray that you understand the importance of, of and the necessary means by which God is laying such a powerful foundation. Because again, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It belongs to you. And it's the call of God, the plan of God, the will of God, that through the words that we're speaking unto you, you come to the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We recognize this. These are principles that we all know, but the Bible says people perish where there's a lack of knowledge. Knowledge is the effect of knowing, having heard or learned something. But what we're learning is not something that was designed to only teach us in our heads, but to become part of our spirits because the way that God does it is God sows the word. And when the word is sown, it grows, it develops. And so how God wants us to move into, he says that when we have knowledge of his will or when we have knowledge of Jesus, we become partakers of his divine nature. And so it's through the knowledge of God's word and the knowledge of his will that we become the partaker of his divine nature. And so I want you to understand this because everybody in here today, God wants you to partake of something. Amen. So as we closed out the last session, I talked about, of course, as we showed in the Gospels, where Jesus healed them all. But I want to show you also real quick that after Jesus' resurrection, because he was the first fruits of all of creation, that the disciples and those who believed on his name continued and maintained the same power to heal them all. Somehow in the mindsets of normal believers, we say, yeah, but that was Jesus, and somehow his power was diminished in us. I want to remind you that from the time that God rose from the dead, Jesus rose again from the dead, and he gave his power to his disciples that the disciples did not fail. What do I mean? Well, there is a passage in the book of uh, Matthew, I believe it's chapter 9, it may be chapter 12, where it talks about when Jesus went into his own hometown. I mean, remember that story. And the Bible says that where he went to his own hometown, he went into the synagogue to teach, but the people could not believe. 
They were familiar with him. They did not believe on Jesus. And the Bible says even Jesus in that town could not do many miracles or mighty works because of their unbelief except save, heal a few sick folk. Right? But what I'm about to show you is that when it comes to disciples and those that believe on Jesus, what you're going to find is that even Peter, in his set, in what God called him to do, when Peter walked in God's power, Peter had power to heal them all. Paul had power to heal them all. James had power to heal them all. Stephen had power to heal them all. Guess what? You, I, have power to heal them all. You have to understand that it's God's will that all are healed. It's not God's will that any person that's here leaves the same, but it's God's will for every person who comes to the knowledge of Christ and his resurrection that that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will perform this work. Watch this for just a minute. Acts chapter 3, I'm going to go quickly into these. James and John, I mean, Peter and James go up to the, uh, to the gate, beautiful, at the temple. And there, this is where the lame man is healed. But in verse 11, it says that the lame man which was healed held on to Peter and John. And all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's porch, greatly wondering. All the people came and began to wonder at what happened. When Peter saw it, he answered unto the people and said unto them, You men of Israel, why are you wondering? Why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this lame man to walk? For it is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, who has glorified his son, the very one in whom you delivered up, the very one that you denied, even in the presence of Pilate, when Pilate was determined to let him go. Yes, this is the very one that you denied. You denied the Holy One, the just one, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. You even killed the Prince of Life, whom God has what? Raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses. And it's his name. Through faith in his name that this man is made strong. Whom you both see and know for the faith is which is by him has given this man perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Today what you need to understand is, is, is that as we're preaching, as we're teaching, make it clear. Make it very clear in your own understanding. People, I have not come in my own name. I've come in the name of the one who sent me, the name of the one who sent you. And it's through his name and faith in his name that your miracles will fully manifest. People, you're not looking unto me. You're not looking unto me as I have some supernatural power to do something. Like I said, I'm anointed to preach the word, certainly. And I'm anointed to set captives free and heal broken hearts, certainly. But people, even in that, it's not because of my name, but it's because I've been called by his name, and the name that I preach is higher than every other name. And so as we move forward into the vision, I want to make it very clear that God is glorifying his son, Jesus, and he's presenting to you his name. It is in his name and faith in his name. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. I want you to see it.
God who at sundry times, and people, these things are going to be important that I'm reading because I'm about to take you into the vision. Whew. God who at sundry or diverse times and in different manners spoke in the past times. He spoke unto the fathers by the prophets. However, in these last days, he has spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and it was by him that he made the worlds. He's the first fruit of all of creation. Glory to God. Who being in the brightness of God's glory, the express image of God's person, he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He was made so much better than the angels. And he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Most of you are familiar with and you know the scriptures in Philippians chapter 2 that talks about how he was highly exalted and he received a name that is higher than any other name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and tongue confess to the glory of God that he is Lord. It's in his name and faith in his name. He has obtained a name that's more excellent than any other name. And at his name, every knee will bow and tongue confess. We understand in Ephesians chapter 1 that he has been exalted and sits at the right hand of the Father. And there his name is higher than principalities, than powers, than spiritual wickedness, than rulers of darkness. His name is greater than any other name. What you need to understand is this. That though Jesus was called the Son of God from before the foundations of the earth, it was when he rose again from the dead in perfect. Because people throughout the history of mankind, there have been many who have been named Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus. But when he rose again with that name, it was when he rose again from the dead that that name that he possessed became higher than any other name. Why is this important? Because as we move into this, as we move into the vision, as we move into this, you're going to see that God has exalted his word above his name. And when Jesus says these words, he says, my word are spirit and life. He's the first fruit of all of creation. There's nothing that you have need of that was not originally made by the word and cannot be replaced by the word. If God made it the first time, he can make it a second. Even that which was corrupted, that which was destroyed, that has come under the power of the law of sin and death, Jesus became a curse for us that we might be redeemed, having nailed the handwriting of ordinances which was against us to the tree. He has turned it back, and now when we believe in his name, all things become possible to us. We know this. So as a believer, as we come into this moment, what you're going to recognize is the Bible is very, very, very clear. Go with me to Hebrews 11. We're going to go back to 1 John, I mean John chapter 1, and then we're going to get into the vision. But again, I'm looking for the day star in your heart. 
I'm looking for that thing to come alive so bright on the inside of you that you recognize, my God. Habakkuk, I know you're going to Hebrews 11, and I know you're going to John chapter 1. But Habakkuk, the prophet, has been speaking and has spoken and said, I will set me upon my watch, come upon the high tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and how I will answer when I am reproved. I said it last night, and I'm going to say it again. In every circumstance and situation, that which is made available to you by revelation requires a response from you in the revelation. The man with the withered hand had to stretch it forth. The woman with the issue of blood had to touch the hem. Whatever it was, they had to obey that word that came. The word is spirit and life. It produces. So today, as we sever the spirits of infirmity, as we break the power of every curse, as we lay hands on you, glory to God, the anointing that comes upon you will require a response. Now watch this. Because what did, Habakkuk, what did Jesus say to Habakkuk when I said Jesus? I just read it in Hebrews chapter 1. God in past times spoke unto the prophets. So he's the one that spoke unto Habakkuk and said, Habakkuk, stand on your watch and see what I'm going to say, and I'm going to see how you answer. And when he began to answer, God says, now write it down and make it plain so those who read it can run with it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So where am I at? Hebrews chapter 11. So he says there that we just saw in Hebrews chapter 1 that Jesus, who is in the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person, he is the one that upholds all things by the word of his power. When he himself purged your sins and sat down on the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the most powerful of angels, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Upholding all things by the word of his power. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance. Everybody say substance. Okay. So I say to one, go, and he goes. But I say to another, come. And he comes. All right. I hope you're following me. Ooh. I say to another one, come, and he comes. Another one, do this, and he does it. Substance, 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 substance. Not the substance of healing, the substance of things made new. Now faith is when? Thank you for four of you. Get your healing today. <laughs> now, faith is the substance, things made new, of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You don't see it yet, but it's about to appear. I've stood upon my watch to see what he would say. And when I see it, he's wanted to see how I would respond. And there, as it manifests, I make it clear. Watch this now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. I already shared with you Psalms, I think it's 139, that talks about your substance was not hidden from him. Whatever substance you have need of, All right. So, say you've dealt with, say you've had 
an issue with diabetes and you need a pancreas. You, you need that one that's worn out and not working right to be new. Substance. Say you've got chronic congestive heart failure. The doctors can't do anything for you. They've, 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 they've just said, look, we're, all we can do is give you blood thinners and some medicine to help you breathe a little bit better, and maybe we can do some procedures and try to make your life a little bit better. No, God has a substance called a new heart. I'm, sure, I'm, I'm taking you somewhere. Whatever it is that has deteriorated and become a a uh, source of pain and uh, uh, this this um, I don't know pain and, and 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 frustration to your life, right? It doesn't work like it used to work. Substance, substance, substance. So the same I've already said, we're gonna say to some go. We're gonna cut off the life source of spirits of infirmity, but we're gonna say to some other stuff, come. And it comes. See, I've already been calling on the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham and Isaac. I've already been calling on the God of my fathers. I've already been calling on the word. For what? For the substance of what you've been believing God for. Glory to God. For by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what better report you can have than to say, I once was, but now I am. He did it. It's done. It's finished. Where I was once believing, I now have a testimony where I can tell others, do it again, God. For by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Verse 3, and this is the only other one I'm going to here in Hebrews, and we're going to go to John chapter 1. Through faith, we understand. Understand. Everybody say understand. That's the day star. That's the illumination in your spirit. Through faith, you can see it. You can't see it in the natural, but you see it by faith. Now, follow me. I, I'm, people, <laughs> whoo, shake how Monday bulls die. I hope you can see what I saw, because I already got it. Amen? Through faith, we understand. Everybody say, through faith. Through faith. I understand. Say it again like you believe it. Through faith, Through faith I, understand. I understand. Now, all of us know enough to recognize that understanding is literally the act of seeing what you did not yet know. In other words, when you came to understanding, you saw it. That make sense? Well, people in the kingdom of God, two plus two still equals four. What do I mean by that? His word never changes. We opened yesterday and drove it home. I hope that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We drove it home. He is the Lord your God who changes not. We drove it home to show you it is his will just as much that you be forgiven of your sins and go to heaven, it is his will that you be free from whatever, sickness, infirmity, disease, or, or situation. Through faith we understand that the ages or the worlds are framed or were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made by things which do appear. Ooh, glory, glory, glory. His word is spirit and life. 
You can't see it, but it has power to create. John chapter 1. Then I'm going to take you into Revelation. And you know, I was thinking about this earlier, about Revelation. Because many times, one of the biggest mistakes that we make, I know nobody in this room has ever made this mistake, but I've made it before, and that is I think I knew something. I, I've made that mistake. Well, I already know that. No, I didn't know this. I thought I knew what that meant till I saw this, and then I thought, okay, well, that's important, but wow. John chapter 1. We brought this one last night, but we're bringing the whole thing back around. Jason, you texted me this morning or last night. He was all in it. Praise the Lord. He texted me and said, well, I saw something last night. I know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Without him there was not anything that was made, anything made that was made. As we begin to move, I want you to understand those of you who are believing God and need some sort of absolute creative miracle. The things that are made are not by things, made by things which are seen. I don't have to go and create some titanium joint and open you up. That's made by something we can see. But the Word of God has power to create. Oh, I hope you're ready. For in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. You see, inside of your body right now, the only light that is working is the light of God's Word. It's God's Word that's holding your substance together. And it's God's Word that has the ability to bring you new substance, recreate or create whatever it is that you have need of. Verse 14, the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld, saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, today, you will behold the glory of God because a creative miracle is about to manifest in your body. The Word made flesh. Oh, we know it's talking about Jesus, but I'm talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Go with me to Ezekiel. Father, make it so clear and so plain that as I share this word, God, may they see what I saw Know what I know and receive the full manifestation of this word. Ezekiel chapter 37. Many of you have read this. You're familiar with it. It's a story that's been preached. It's a story that's been talked about. It's a story that we think we know. Uh, 
Jesse Duplantis. How many of you guys know who Jesse Duplantis is? All right. How many of you have ever seen Jesse's testimony of when he went to heaven? Okay. Called up to heaven, like Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, saw things that it's not lawful for men to speak about. In other words, it's not in the law, but it's heavenly. And some of the things that he discussed in his vision, I didn't have a problem with. I just didn't have word for it. Why? Because God upholds all things by the power of his word. And throughout my life, I've always been an individual who said, all right, God, if it's true, then you've got a word for it. Even though a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument, a man with an experience based on the word has an anchor and can repeat the manifestation over and over and over. So Jesse, I remember in one of his part of the testimony of going to heaven, he talked about going up to heaven and looking into, as it were, a warehouse, a room. And there in that warehouse, in that room, it just seemed like the substance of anything anybody could need. It was like there was a heavenly treasury. Didn't Jesus say for us to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt? Didn't he say that we have the ability to do that? Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 37. And we're going to go through it slowly. And I pray the vision unfolds before your eyes. The hand of the Lord was upon me. Remember in Acts chapter 4, God, that you would stretch forth your hand and confirm your word, that it was by your hand that signs and wonders were done. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. Jesus said it. My words are spirit and they are life. So the hand of the Lord came upon him and carried him out in the word. Carried him out in the spirit of the Lord and there in the word he set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. He set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them around and about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now watch this for just a minute because I'm going to prayerfully begin to correct a misconception so that you can see it the way God intended it. First of all, it was in the Spirit in God's word that God carried Ezekiel out into the midst of a valley and he caused Ezekiel to walk through the midst in and about, round and about and he said there were very many bones and they were dry. Watch this. What Ezekiel was put into the midst of, he was put into the midst of where the curse had ransacked, completely destroyed an entire army. He saw an army that had been utterly defeated by an alien, by an enemy, by a work of darkness, and they were left in this valley to where the birds had picked the flesh. There was nothing left but a valley filled of bones. They were dry very dry. What Ezekiel was witnessing was a mass graveyard where death and the stench of death 
had existed for such a long time, there was nothing left. There were not even any longer birds circling to pick the flesh, for they were dry. They were very dry. There was nothing left. The enemy had utterly defeated and destroyed this army. Now, I want you to see this because, people, this is the vision. This is the revelation. So God carried Ezekiel out into the midst of what was one of the most devastating sights anybody could put their eyes on. Imagine for just a minute, standing in the midst of a field where a great battle once was fought, and in that fight there was nothing left but the evidence of death. Nothing left but the evidence of death. Nothing left but the evidence of decay, of death, of an enemy. Nothing left but the evidence of what once was. Nothing left but the evidence of something that could have been but no longer exists. Follow me. Evidence. Evidence evidence. And God says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel answered, and this is where we've missed it. I saw this so strong in my spirit. For every time I had read this up until the time God took me into the revelation, I approached it like this. Only you know. Versus, no, God, you know they can live. Only you know, God. Not only you know, God, it may be possible, it may not be possible, it could be possible. I'm not sure, God. Maybe you're going to show me. What should I do? I'm not really sure, God. Only you know, God. No, you know, God. Can these bones live? God, you know they can. Why? God was looking for the response. What do you see? Here is my response. God, you know. Can live. You know it. It can live. You know they can live. How do we know that that's the context of Ezekiel's answer? Because God's reply was what? Speak prophesy. Say what you see. Ooh, glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. So let's look at what Ezekiel did. He said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? I answered and say, God, you know they can. You absolutely know they can. God, I know you know, and I know you know. I know you are able. Glory to God. You wouldn't have brought me into this place had you not intended me to absolutely destroy the works of darkness and bring about the end result of who you are as God. People, God would not have brought you into this place and to such a time as this if he had not intended. Can these bones live? I answer, God, you know. So God said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto these, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. O ye dry bones, O evidence of death, hear the word. Where there's evidence of decay, where there's evidence of death, where there's evidence of destruction, where there's evidence of dry bones, where there's evidence of nothing left. All I'm telling you to do is speak to them. Say unto them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Well, some of you in this room, when the day star dawns in your heart, you're going to start speaking to your dry bones. You're going to start speaking to your hip and say, hip, hear the word of the Lord. Shoulder, hear the word of the Lord. Eyes, hear the word of the Lord. Whatever it is, hear the word, hear the word of the Lord. I will hear the word of the Lord. 
This is not my word. This is the word of the Lord. Say unto it, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Unto the evidence of death, decay, and destruction in your life. This is what the Lord says. I will cause Ruach, breath, spirit, word to enter into you, and that which was dead shall live. Yes. That which was eaten up and destroyed by arthritis, all of a sudden the arthritis has to leave because, bless God, life has entered in. That which was once dead has to now respond to the word of the Lord. Here, I will cause the word breath, ruach, spirit. My words are spirit and life to enter into you and you will live. Hear the word of the Lord, shoulder. Hear the word of the Lord, knee. Hear the word of the Lord, heart. Hear the word of the Lord, pancreas. Hear the word of the Lord, liver. Hear the word of the Lord. You'll live. Oh, my well, Jesus, I just hope I live and not die. Maybe you'll give me one more year. No, bless God, as my days are, so shall my strength be. For my days are 120 years upon the earth. Come on. Hear the word of the Lord. And watch what he says. Now, I want you, I want you to see this. Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, I will cause breath. Ruach to enter into you, and you will live. Verse 6, and I will lay sinew upon you. And I will bring flesh upon you. And I will cover you with skin. And I will put breath, Ruach, spirit in you, and you will live, and you will know that I am the Lord. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to see this for just a minute. Because this is a vision, a revelation that God gave me. I never saw this before. But when I began to see this, what I saw happening with Ezekiel is as God took him and set him there and said, I want you to speak unto these bones, hear the word of the Lord. And this is what God says unto you, O bones, I will. Faith begins where the will of God is known. I will lay sinew upon you. Now think about it for just a minute. Because most of us, we have our children's church flannel graph idea of the valley full of dry bones. Right? We have the, uh, what, what's the... Uh, the, the, the hip bone said to the knee, whatever, you know, the leg bone and the leg bone to the knee bone and, you know, all of those sorts of things that, that we have in our mindset. And, and we kind of have this vision of, well, the, the bones kind of hopping into place and connecting to one another, you know, and, and the bones just are connected to bone and the neck bones connected to the backbone and, and here they are in this valley and all these bones are coming together. And that's a childish view of what happened. Thank God for it. And thank God that bone came to bone. And thank God that all the joints were put in place. But what I want you to see is, is that Zeke, Ezekiel, the prophet by the Spirit of God, began to speak to what I just described as one of the most devastating sights a man could ever witness, the witness of death and destruction that was beyond comprehension. And in an instant, through the word of God, now, all of a sudden, that which was dead, hearing the word of God, and the resurrection life, the first fruit of creation being put into action. And now, not only do bones come to bones. So just for the sake of, of our own minds, our, our limited minds, because Ezekiel doesn't tell us how many were there. He just says there were many, and there were very many. 
But just for the sake of who we are in this room today, let's say that that battle, that devastation there was an army of 10,000 soldiers. Let's just put a number on it. There were 10,000 soldiers that had completely destroyed, had gone. So there were 10,000 sets of wrists, elbows, shoulders, hips, ankles, knees, just lying out in the valley, all scattered, dried up, nothing left, ten thousands of them. They're all out there. And then God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say, hear ye the word of the Lord and say, thus says the Lord, I will lay sinew upon you and bring flesh upon you. People, do you think for just a minute when God raised up that army that they were just shells? That they were just skeletons with skin? No. Not only did bone come to bone, but there was fresh cartilage in every joint. There was fresh ligaments that grew and attached. The knees together, the shoulders together, the hips together. There were brand new joints and ball joints and cartilages and things that needed to exist in order for an exceeding great army to arise. There was everything necessary one by one by one by one to 10,000 men. Creative miracles. Then, 10,000 brand new hearts, 10,000 brand new sets of lungs, 10,000 brand new kidneys, 10,000 brand new livers, 10,000, right, brand new pancreases, 10,000 brand new spinal cords, 10,000 brand new brains, cerebral cortexes, people, nothing is impossible for God. When Ezekiel began to speak to them, creative power went into work. And that which did not exist, that which needed to be made, was made not by things which are seen, but by the word of God. And as that which needed to be made was made by the word of God, all of a sudden, sinews came upon, flesh came upon. God, they were covered with brand new skin, without disease, without infirmity, without Without, without, without. And you shall live. And so what does he say? And you'll live. And you will know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Behold, there was a shaking. Bones came together, bone to bone. And when I beheld, excuse me, when I looked, when I beheld, when I looked, when I beheld, when I looked, cartilages, tendons, ligaments, shoulders, hips, ankles, knees, necks, backs, I beheld, and what happened? Glory to God. There was a noise, sinews, and flesh came upon them, and then the skin covered them above, yet there was still no breath in them. God said unto me, prophesy now unto the wind. Prophesy unto the breath. The word wind, breath, is ruach, it's spirit. Saying, son of man, say unto the wind, thus says the Lord God, Come ye four winds and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been calling on the four winds of heaven. And today, whatever miracle you have need of, there's creation, creative 
power in the midst. And as God creates new, the breath of God, the wind of God, the word of God is going to make that which was unanimated become animated. He's going to take that which was one dead, once dead, to come to life again. As I prophesied unto the wind, the breath came upon them, and they become an exceeding great army. Ladies and gentlemen, the vision that I want you to see is that there is a warehouse in heaven. There is a treasury in heaven. It's full of any and every body part you could ever need or want. It's not impossible for God. All God says is say unto your bones, hear the word of the Lord. For I will cause breath to enter you. I will lay sin you upon you. I will cause flesh to come upon you. So today as we're going to move into the close of this time, people, it's exactly what God wants to do. He's not keeping it from you. He's wanting it manifest in you. How many of you believe? Glory to God. Not because I said it, but because God's word says it. And you will behold the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, God's word working in you to produce in you exactly what he said. There's nothing that you have need of. As I moved into this revelation, I began to realize that, see, there's been a lot of things in my life that I have believed God for, but my attitude was only you know versus Oh, no, God, you know, you know, you know. And that's why I come today to say, look, I've been wanting to do these miracle and healing meetings. Why? Because I believe there is no limit to the creative power of God to produce in you, to create, to bring to life again, to take the evidence of that which was dead and replace it with the evidence of your faith. Because now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For the things that you're about to walk in are not made by things which appear, but they're made because of the word of God. And God's word is for you. God's word will produce what he said it'll produce. It's not that difficult. We don't walk according to what we see. It's not according to our feelings. But certainly, we will recover. We will heal. And as the scripture said, believers in my name will lay hands on them and they shall recover. And I know, I know where we're at and I know what we're doing, but I'm, I'm, I'm just here, people, to tell you that I believe that God is doing an absolute creative miracle. Absolute creative miracles that he will give you brand new. He will cause flesh and sin you. He will cause there to come upon you that which did not exist, and he will completely restore it. Glory to God. Amen. So today, what we want to do, what I want to do, is I want us to prophesy. I want us to say to ourselves, self, amen. Be healed, be whole, be free. You begin to speak to yourself and whatever part of self is that needs a creative miracle, you tell the part of yourself that needs a creative miracle. You hear the word of the Lord. Because this word, God will cause flesh and sin you. He will cause an absolute new and powerful creative miracle in my life. It is Jesus who, again, is the first fruits of all of creation. Whatever it is that you need created. Is it a new brain? Is it a new back? Is it a new heart, a new liver, a new kidney? If he did it to an army of 10,000, what do you think he can do in here? Is he still the same yesterday, today, and forever? Is he the Lord our God who changes not? People, you're not looking unto me. We're looking unto him. 
the author and the finisher of our faith. Glory to God. So whatever it is, whatever it is that you're trusting and believing God for, for these bones shall live. These bones shall rise again. And this is where Romans chapter 8, closing with this, and then I'm going to pray for those who want prayer. The Bible says this. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead shall raise you from the dead. Quicken your mortal body. Well, we've always related that to when we go to heaven. Yeah, praise the Lord. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will one day raise me up and I'll forever live in heaven. Praise God, I know that. But we need some resurrection power now. We need some stuff in our bodies now. How are we expecting, right, to continue on if we're allowing the devil to continue to eat our lunch and destroy our lives through things that are trespasses? So for this purpose is the Son of God manifest. So I say to one, go, he goes. To another, come, he comes. And to another one, do this, he does this. You'll be cut off from sickness, disease, and infirmity as well as you will now also have creative miracles that begin to form in you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm wanting you to understand this. Glory to God. Just like the individual last night, they didn't really realize it until they got out of the house and then they thought, my goodness, something's happened. Praise the Lord. Well, I believe like the woman with the issue of blood, instantly you're going to know it. I believe that there's going to be instantaneous creative miracles, but glory to God, I believe that all shall be healed because we've demonstrated it is his will to heal them all. Amen. So we're not sitting here waiting to look to see if somebody else gets it. No. I believe that I received yeah. Jesus as a son of God, I thank you that your word is working in me both to will and do of your good pleasure. Holy Spirit, your word is life and health and healing to all of my flesh. Just as Ezekiel prophesied and sinew came upon them and flesh came upon them, Father, your word is health and healing to me. I give you praise, Lord. And I thank you for it. And I thank you, God, that there's nothing impossible. And that today, as, as we pray and lay hands on your people, God, you watch over your word to perform it. And as the four winds of heaven gather, God, that you breathe upon this people, upon this place, and I thank you, God, for absolute creative miracles and restoration. Move in the midst now in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Thank you for viewing our online experience. I pray today's teaching has helped you draw closer to Jesus or inspired you with wisdom and revelation from the Word of God. If you're a new believer or would like to know more about what it is to follow Jesus, please reach out to us on the website or follow us here on social media. Also, if you'd like to contribute to making a difference to lives around the world, please select the giving button on our website. We would love to stay connected with you. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Here at Legacy Faith Church, we decree, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith.